The question is often asked why Jesus spoke in parables to convince the people of another world. Why not tell the simple story and not mystify everything so that even his own disciples could not understand him? I will admit that there is something in that question that looks dark, but when one understands what Jesus was trying to establish or teach, it will give you a very different slant on his ideas. The first question should be, what was Jesus trying to establish? Not take it for granted it was another world. It is generally believed that it was to establish a belief in a future state or world beyond this material world, and it was necessary for him to come from heaven to earth in order for him to teach this great truth, and to show the people that he really did come from heaven, and to make them believe he must show a sign, or do a little something above the rest of mankind. How natural it is to mystify everything so that the ignorant cannot understand. Men do not want to think. So if they can only get rid of investigating a phenomenon and attributing it to an invisible power so that they stand just as well as their neighbors, that is all they want. There is another class called the wise men who have been set up as oracles of wisdom. To them, everything that starts up must take its rise from their fountain or they will open their floodgates and overflow the little streams that are trickling over the rocks and pebbles of their superstition. It is too much labor to be a hewer of wood. So if you take a person of eminence and make him a laborer, he will say, like the slothful servant, that truth is a hard master. So such persons will hide their talent, because they will not put themselves on a level with the thinkers of their age, but rather lie still and cry, Crucify him, for our craft is in danger. The people take the cue and fall upon him with staff and stone, or ridicule, until they have put him down. Then those wise men rise in their majesty and praise the people for their good sense in putting down the very person who is their friend. This was the case with Jesus. The opposition came from the wisest men or class of men who led the people for their own good. This course, taken by the wisdom of this world, has always opposed all science ever since the commencement of the world. For when science is established, the wisdom of this world has to yield. But a hard battle must be fought before the science is established. So when Jesus commenced his reform, he was despised of all men, misrepresented by fools, and construed by knaves and hated by priests and doctors. They thought as they do now, our craft is in danger. So they called him infidel and impostor. When they crucified Jesus, they put such a construction on his acts as they pleased, and instead of giving his ideas, they gave such an opinion as anyone would expect from those who wanted to keep the people in subjection and ignorance. Thus they have explained Jesus' meaning just according to their ideas. Now, the Bible is in the hands of the people, and they can all read and judge for themselves. And everyone has a right in this land of liberty to give his own opinion in regard to the Bible. I will avail myself of the same liberty as others. All I ask of you is to lay aside all prejudices and listen to my explanation of Jesus' mission in the world. I will state what I intend to prove, and afterwards I will prove it, by his works and my own, and leave it to the people to judge which is the most natural construction, the priests or mine. I will now give my opinion. I take this ground, that Jesus never intended to teach any kind of religion 
acknowledged by any religious class of people, but opposed all kinds of religion of his days and ours. Secondly, I say he never meddled with any institution or laws made by the people. Thirdly, he never put any restrictions on man, but left him a free agent to do just as he pleased, but subject to the laws of men. For God never made a law. All laws are the inventions of men, not of God. And Jesus' kingdom, or truth, was not of this world, but of science. His religion was a science, and science was never known to have any connection with ignorance. There are two standards. One is ignorance and the other is science. One belongs to that class of intellect or wisdom that is of this world and can be detected as easily as you can detect any other error. The difference between the two is this. The wisdom of this world tells what others know. It takes a memory of events and the history of the learned for science. But science talks what it knows and stands ready to prove it by works. Here is the difference in men. A great man is one who can remember anything he ever heard and repeat every person's opinion but has no idea of his own. He stands ready to prove all he says by his standard. So if he is doubted, he shows you his authority. Thus he is a sort of court or town record that is ready to receive any opinion that is supposed to be true. Having the court or town stamps, this makes a learned man. A truly scientific man is a book of nature understood so that he can prove all he says. He is made not of opinions but of wisdom, and never refers to old authors, but proves all things by his science. His memory of events or names or places he has no shelf to put on, for to him they are only as an amendment. He listens to persons having that knowledge as a parent listens to a child, to hear him give an account of some play or story that amuses him for the time. In his leisure hours he seeks such men as a person who goes to a play, for the sake of amusement, not expecting to realize any true wisdom. This sort of amusement is of this world, and is well expressed by Shakespeare when he says, All the world's a stage, and all men are players, etc.